Hey, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. And today I've got part two of a three-part series I'm doing documenting the construction of the California High-Speed Rail project in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, this video will focus on construction package 2-3, which, as the name implies, uh, is the combination of two previously unconnected uh, construction packages that were joined in an effort to save time. But it appears like that may have actually kind of backfired. Uh, so... Going forward, I don't think we will see construction packages that are quite this long. Uh, CP23 is actually 65 miles in length, and it extends from just one mile north of the Tulare Kern County line up to 1,000 feet short of the East American Avenue grade separation just south of Fresno. So a number of factors have uh, contributed to the cost of CP23 rising. Uh, originally, it was estimated to cost $1.3 billion. Uh, it is now looking like it's going to cost about $2.1 billion. And uh, like I said, we will see a number of structures uh, and delays and utility relocations have gone into raising the uh, dollar amount for this section of construction. Nevertheless, uh, CP23 does have uh, a number of large structures that are in uh, various states of completion. And it appears like um, the majority of construction is happening on the northern end of CP23. The southern end, it, it kind of, as you go through the, the valley itself, there's, there's more water on the north end. And so there's more development, there's more roads, more canals. And uh, as you go further south, it becomes less and less populated, but also uh, the fields become more and more sparse. Obviously, you can see this section that we're going through uh, is an orchard uh, that a significant amount has been cleared for high-speed rail. But uh, keep in mind, the high-speed rail right-of-way is only about 100 feet wide, so it's not too large, especially compared to uh, some of the other large roads in the valley like I-5 and SR-99. Here we come up to the first grade separation, which is uh, Avenue 24. I believe this will be an undercrossing similar to... Uh, the agricultural undercrossing uh, just north of Avenue 8 in CP1. But uh, it'll be good because there's not a whole lot of roads that go through here. And this is one reason why I didn't document this portion of the project last year. Is because it's very remote. <laughs> um, it was very difficult getting this footage. Uh, a lot of driving on what may or may not have actually been roads and uh but nevertheless i'm glad to document the entire uh cp23 for your viewing pleasure so aside from the avenue 24 grade separation which uh i believe was um, requested by the county to improve access across the corridor uh, there's not a whole lot of structures in this project, so we will go over some uh, facts and figures while we're just kind of flying over <laughs> basically nothing. <laughs> so 29% of the cost increase has been related to time delays. Uh, that would be including land acquisition as well as engineering. Uh, in fact, CP23 as of last year was only 70 some percent complete uh engineering completion so 70 percent of the engineering was completed but that is all supposed to be completed by the end of the year this year 2021 so i believe the majority of the project has been in designed out and uh there are you will see parts of that where uh no work has been completed so there was obviously some delay uh particularly around the deer creek viaduct and the cross creek viaduct of, uh, north of hanford but uh, I will note those when we uh, come up to them. Never, uh, nevertheless, 29% uh, has been time impact of the cost increase has been time delays and 71% were uh, change orders. The largest change order is related to uh, agreement settlements and time impacts. So again, likely right away acquisition or uh, dealing with utility contractor or utility owners. Uh, behind that, uh, the single largest project to raise the cost of this project was the Hanford Viaduct. Originally, the tracks were supposed to go through Hanford at grade, and uh, for various reasons, it was decided to switch to a an elevated uh, viaduct, which will be four tracks, 
and uh, 6,000 feet in length through Hanford, which of course we will see in this video. That alone cost $109 million. Uh, third party re utility relocations has costed $90 million. Keep in mind some of these, when, yeah, when we talk about utility relocations, you know, the first thing that probably comes to mind is like maybe water lines or something, cable, fiber optic that seems like it shouldn't be too difficult to relocate, particularly in undeveloped areas like the uh, San Joaquin Valley. But some of these projects are very complicated, especially in cities, uh, sewer relocations. It can be kind of amazing sometimes how complicated that can be. Uh, if you have to lower a sewer line or raise a sewer line, you might have to build a pump house to pump it through the relocated area. So uh, utility relocations, it sounds benign, but it can actually uh, really trip up a project. So here we are at the Avenue 56 grade separation. And as you can see, a little more than uh, clearing of the right of way has occurred, but it they have graded out a temporary roadway for Avenue 56 while the grade separation is being built. This, I believe, will be a typical grade separation, just a uh, highway style bridge over the tracks. But uh, you can see where that uh, temporary alignment of Avenue 56 has been located. So just to give you a scope of how the right-of-way is actually being constructed, you can see uh, where I changed out drone batteries here at Avenue 56, how much dirt has been piled up. The high-speed rail right-of-way is typically about 10 to 15 feet higher than the existing grade. And that is because uh, whenever it does rain in the Central Valley, uh, because it's basically a bowl from its former life as an inland sea, uh, the water doesn't really have much place to go, so flooding is quite a problem in the valley. And of course, the California High Speed Rail, uh, with the, all of the problems they're having getting it built, is not keen on having the tracks wash out. So, along the right of way, it's being it's being built up, obviously, and also t dozens and dozens of culverts are being built under the right of way to allow water to flow freely and not impact the uh, the track bed bed itself. So up ahead we have the West Isle Line, which is a former Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe branch line that will, uh, goes out to Alpog, California. It is now owned by a uh, private company that is an agricultural company, and they interchange cars with BNSF at uh, the main line off to the right there. And that line goes out to Alpog, California. So you can see that massive solar farm there, uh, some of which has had to been cleared for the California High-Speed Rail right-of-way. But uh, the California High-Speed Rail Authority is actually targeting uh, solar power to provide the majority of the traction power powering the high-speed trains, because obviously this will be all electrified. And uh, they were saying that high-speed trains, modern high-speed trains, can use up to 8 megawatts of electricity, which is a huge amount. Uh, I believe that would power a couple thousand homes or something like that. And so, obviously, they've, they've got the data. They think that the solar power can support it. And, of course, it will be their solar generating capabilities will be tied into the existing power grid. So they won't be completely lost if there's like a cloudy day or something like that but uh it's kind of interesting i'm sure that there will be more solar farms built across the system uh, as this project continues so here we have deer creek and uh, this is where the location of the deer creek viaduct will be uh the deer creek viaduct was originally this along with the cross creek were very long viaducts that have been uh, redesigned deer creek has been cut down from i believe uh in a in excess of a mile long to uh, just a 3,000 foot long structure. I would imagine the original uh, design of that viaduct included 
a single viaduct structure spanning the West Isle line as well as the Deer Creek. But it uh, looks like they've cut that down to save money, obviously, and uh, probably replacing the space between the West Isle line and Deer Creek with uh, elevated fill dirt embankment, which is good to see them trying to save costs uh, because obviously, yes, the cost of the project has uh, gone up significantly from the 2008 uh, projection of $32 billion, but nevertheless, that doesn't change uh, the importance of this project. So here, uh, I'm sure that section that we just passed over uh, was a victim of possibly delayed right-of-way acquisition or uh, and certainly design changes. But here we can see where the right-of-way paralleling the BNSF tracks and uh, Highway 43, the right-of-way has actually been cleared for high-speed rail. And uh, it's definitely a theme with uh, Construction Package 2.3. There are a ton of uh, dry canals uh, along this section of the right-of-way so it remains to be seen how many of these canals will actually are still in use and have to be relocated particularly in the Hanford area but nevertheless we can see a canal off to the left that has I believe been relocated as part of this project so here's the first actual <laughs> real sign of construction in CP23 and this is the Avenue 88 grade separation you can see that the bridge is basically complete. Walls are complete and everything. Uh, but the road approaches on either side have not yet been paved. So here is something that I thought it would be kind of fun. I actually rode a San Joaquin back from Bakersfield to Oakland because I wanted to see these sections of the high-speed rail line that uh, parallel the BNSF tracks for myself. And here we can see the train going underneath uh, the Avenue 88 grade separation. Uh, the, this the view that you're seeing is the back of the Siemens Charger locomotive and of course it has that aerodynamic uh, spoiler fin type thing uh, because it's usually going to be mated to a superliner which we were riding on but uh, the coach between the Charger locomotive was and the superliner one that we were riding on was a uh, Horizon coach the uh, ex New Jersey transit cars so if it had been a superliner we probably wouldn't have been able to get that view so it just kind of Worked out serendipitously uh, that I was able to get that footage, and we'll be seeing a couple more spots along that in this video. But anyway, we can see the existing alignment of Avenue 88 and the grade crossing over BN at BNSF, and of course this road will be removed once the bridge is complete. I again want to give a big shout out to my friend Cody who drove me around the valley so graciously because uh, without him I definitely wouldn't have been able to get all this footage. Certainly wouldn't have been able to get all this footage in the two days uh, that we were able to film this all in. Uh, the project, like I said, it's under construction right now is 119 miles and uh, it was quite a big job getting it all filmed with a drone. but. I really appreciate his help and uh, nevertheless I'm glad that I'm able to provide this drone footage for everybody to see because I uh, I still get comments from people that think that uh, the you know, project has been completely canceled and of course that's not the case uh, there hasn't been any new construction pro uh, construction packages signed uh, with contractors since Gavin Newsom uh, kind of uh, used his power to prevent that from happening but uh, nevertheless the California legislature still has about four billion dollars allocated for California high-speed rail and construction is still moving forward hopefully the legislature will get on the ball and uh, release those funds early next year I believe their session has actually been completed this year but uh, this is a very important project if you hadn't seen my previous video kind of overviewing the project I am a very strong supporter of it and I uh, hope to see great things happening in the future with regards to completing this project because obviously um, the project was not designed to go from Merced to Bakersfield uh, that will be kind of phase one opening uh, when 
the right of way actually gets built out and the, the tracks get laid and the electrification gets built. Merced to Bakersfield will be phase one, but of course this is not just a line to ferry people between Merced and Bakersfield. It is a project to construct a high-speed line capable of running trains at 220 miles per hour between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And anybody that thinks that this project will not be completed or shouldn't be completed are uh, vastly underestimate the potential of high-speed rail and uh, the potential of the California government to uh, build massive projects. So here we are through the ghost town of Angiola, and I believe uh, that you, that old facility on the right will be removed, and I, I would imagine that uh, these grain elevators will be relocated to the opposite side of the tracks, the east side of the tracks. But uh, I'm sure that there's probably been ongoing uh, issues with the uh, the facility there and uh, pro potentially BNSF and so not a whole lot of work has been ongoing through here. Avenue 12 will be uh, a grade separated road as well Avenue 120 up ahead. Here is a significant canal that will have to be decked over or culvert built and uh, potentially when these culverts are built, temporary canal alignments have to be built. So nothing, nothing is simple about this project. Um, and it's not to say that everything is inherently more complicated because it's high speed rail. It's just building anything, uh, conventional railway or highway included will have to, or <laughs> hyperloop if you're one of the, uh, kind of disciples of Elon Musk, uh, any project going through the Central Valley will have to contend with the same factors that California High Speed Rail is. And that will make any project being built to connect the two cities extremely expensive. Um, I also want to elaborate on the misconception that airplanes are sufficient to, it's a, a, a sufficient transportation option for the residents of California. And uh, there's still so many people that believe that Cal California high-speed rail should have been built along the I-5. Uh, it's really a dead horse at this point, but nevertheless, I guess I will give my opinions on it. Uh, when I was booking the trip that I just went on out to Seattle, I also went down into California. And um, yeah, there's not a whole lot of options <laughs> for airplane travel. The only city that California High Speed Rail will serve in the valley that has airline access, commercial avi airline access, is Bakersfield. And there's like a couple of flights a day to San Francisco. And I guess that's great if you're in Bakersfield and want to commute at kind of business hours. But uh, High Speed Rail will be a much more kind of transformational project because it will provide all day service. It might not be at the <laughs> five minute headways that the line will support, especially from day one, but nevertheless, it will provide more consistent service linking the actually linking the cities in the Central Valley like Bakersfield and Fresno and even Hanford, whether or not they want the line built. But that's kind of a moot point in this point because uh the line is definitely uh in full swing construction and also uh as far as bypassing the central valley towns like hanford or fresno and bakersfield uh with the i5 alignment it really kind of misses the fundamental point of this project which is to stimulate the economies in the central valley because as you may be able to tell from the footage like the the roads that were paved like 60 years ago it's it's the same asphalt <laughs> and in a lot of places and some places roads that were previously paved have kind of been reduced back to gravel roads or dirt roads because the pavement has just deteriorated uh, there's not much investment going on in the central valley and it's kind of dying a slow death particularly in the face of climate change so uh, I want to just interrupt myself 
real quick, here we are at the Thule River Viaduct. Uh, this will be a significant structure spanning the Thule River right there. And it will ha also have a pergola structure to bring the tracks, the high speed rail tracks over the BNSF and Highway 43. Here we are back on the San Joaquin and you can see that uh, Pacific Rim Dairy off to the left, which is a former uh, dairy that was closed. Um, and you can see all of the, uh, the construction preparation that is going, uh, all the material staging off to the left. Here is the actual Thule River. And you can see the many pilings are being built, drilled simultaneously for this huge pergola structure. Uh, this structure will be a similar size and scope to the, uh, to say like the Wasco Viaduct or the uh, San Joaquin River Viaduct. It won't be quite that long, but it, nevertheless, it will be a huge structure. So we can see that progress is definitely been going on in the month or so between the drone footage and this footage that I just captured on the train. But uh, here we are back in the air and you can see, uh, like I said, there's many more pilings that have been drilled since this footage was shot. And so it's nice to see that progress is definitely moving forward. Also keep in mind, all of this drone footage was filmed on the weekend uh, over Saturday and Sunday. So there wasn't a whole lot of work going on in the drone footage because obviously it was the weekend. So I've had some comments uh, saying that there's no actual work going on, which is a sign of the project being failed or something, some nonsense along those lines. Anyway, you can see that uh, SR-43 has been temporarily realigned uh, to allow construction of this pergola structure to go forward. Here at Avenue 144, I believe the road was actually closed west of SR-43 because of the uh, construction. And uh, just north of Avenue 144, we see this massive culvert structure, uh, cast in place culvert, which is being still framed out in this video. But uh, to go back to what I was talking about uh, originally, um, yes, the I-5 uh, route would bypass all of the Central Valley cities. And uh, again, like I said, it m completely misses the point of the project, which is to invest large amounts of money across underserved sections of the state in the Sa San Joaquin Valley and Eventually, when the line is extended up to Sacramento, uh, the, uh, the Central Valley as a whole. Because the uh, towns and cities across the Central Valley uh, have really not received the same even percentage amount of investment that uh, the large cities in California have received as far as state and federal money go. But the whole point of the California High Speed Rail Project is to invest in historically underinvested communities and build new housing because California has so such a large house, uh, housing demand that is not being met by uh, current market conditions and to open up new economic opportunities to com the communities like Fresno, Hanford, Bakersfield uh, that you know going forward with, from this pandemic it it, who knows what the future of work may hold, but uh, I, I doubt people will be commuting from Bakersfield to the Bay Area five days a week. That even on high speed rail is kind of ludicrous. But, uh, you know, if people only have to go into the office maybe one day a week, that might seem a lot more attractive. You know, maybe people can live in Hanford and have that, you know, kind of country living feel and then pop into the city once a week or maybe even less, you know. Who knows? Either way, I know that uh, the project will stimulate uh, economic investment in these communities that it serves through. It's basically impossible that it won't. And that, that is one reason why I fully support this project in its current form going through the San Joaquin Valley and linking the cities of Fresno and Bakersfield to the Bay Area and uh, Los Angeles. <sighs> I'm not going to say that I... You know, people are necessarily wrong, but it is a little bit tiring hearing all of the, um, seeing all the negative comments that I get on these videos from people that fundamentally kind of don't understand what this project is trying to do and how absurd it is that high speed rail is seen as such an like un unknown, but also like 
impossible thing to be built in the United States because obviously this country is still the wealthiest country in the world. And uh, high-speed lines have been built around the world uh, to varying degrees of success, but nevertheless, they, it, it is very possible to build a high-speed railway. The only problem is that we basically don't have one. I mean, yes, the Northeast Corridor typically, uh, technically has high-speed sections in, you know, Connecticut, or not Connecticut, but Rhode Island and New Jersey. But And so, yes, there is a learning curve adapting foreign high-speed rail technology to American railway standards uh, and seismic standards uh, being here in California. But uh, somebody's got to be first, and California is leading the way. I'm not saying that nobody else can do it. I'm looking forward to uh, Texas Central beginning construction, hopefully sooner rather than later. I think that's a fantastic project that's very exciting, and I very much look forward to it happening and <laughs> when they do start working on it you better believe i'm going to make videos about it uh, but yes california is just kind of taking all the heat because they are first and uh they're working the bugs out and jumping through all the regulatory hurdles with the fra and various other stakeholders so it's yes this project isn't perfect but it i it's a good project in my book so so as we're coming into Corcoran, you can see a number of roads that will be rerouted or re realigned to allow the high-speed rail construction. You can see that new canal culvert has been built, I believe. Uh, high, obviously, the high-speed rail tracks will cross over that, but some combination of roads, including Orange Avenue here off to the right and Wakena Avenue uh, just north of that canal will be realigned around the tracks. I believe only one bridge will be built in Corcoran, or at least in this section of Corcoran. Off to the left, you can see kind of a curved pattern of cleared trees through that, that orchard off to the left. Uh, that will be the actually the future route of this canal that we're crossing over. The canal will be uh, realigned to cross under the high-speed rail tracks at a right angle. And you can see that cast-in-place culvert is being built currently to uh, carry that canal uh, in the future. So just north of this canal crossing, I believe we'll probably uh, be uh, see Niles Avenue rerouted off to the right of the high-speed rail tracks to run into Avenue 5.5, where I believe another high-speed rail bridge will be built to allow um, Avenue 5.5 to run underneath it. And yes, Avenue 5.5 is also known as Van Dorsten Avenue through Corcoran. Not exactly sure what's going to happen here at Newark Avenue. Uh, if there will be another bridge built, I uh, I just don't know. <laughs> it might be rerouted off to the left side of the right of way. Uh, we will just see going forward. It's kind of hard because I've spent so much time combing through the environmental impact reports. Uh, but then again, there's also been so many change orders. So knowing exactly what's going to be built, uh, particularly up here north of uh, Corcoran, we will see another area that has been basically untouched because it's been going through various design changes. But uh, getting a sense of what's actually going to be built without seeing the project in place uh, on the ground is kind of tricky in some cases, particularly through Corcoran. So as the tracks begin to rejoin the alignment of SR43 in the BNSF tracks, we see Nevada Avenue. Now originally there was a grade separation that was planned to carry Nevada Avenue over the high-speed rail tracks SR43 and the BNSF. 
and of course it would have some kind of complicated <laughs> uh, complicated ramp or something to connect it to SR43 and then of course we have these two canals and for all these reasons it looks like the Nevada Avenue grade separation has been axed and uh, Nevada Avenue will dead end at the high-speed rail tracks uh, I'm sure that simplifies construction because obviously the uh, building the, the culverts to cross over those canals is going to be quite complicated in and of itself so here we'll take a brief pause to see a BNSF train crossing the uh, Nevada Avenue this is obviously uh, an intermodal train so some kind of Z train possibly heading to Barstow and points east maybe Memphis or Chicago something like that it's kind of impossible to see to know just based on the uh, containers but likely headed in that direction so here we have another solar farm I uh, obviously I don't believe this is owned by the California High-Speed Rail Authority but certainly this section where the panels have been removed is um, I don't know exactly how many solar fields uh, will have to be built to support the demands of the high-speed rail authority but uh, nevertheless I'm sure they will probably be built near the tracks if possible so it'll be interesting to see going forward uh, where and where those are built out and how how it's all going to work here's yet another canal crossing obviously this one is in use but uh, like I said, there's there's a ton of canals around here that are appear to be dead, but uh, that may they may just be seasonal canals. It's uh, really hard to know, and even <laughs> even finding the names of canals can be uh, pretty difficult sometimes. Uh, here is what was originally the start of the Cross Creek Viaduct, which was going to be basically in excess of two miles long, but that has been shortened to only 2,500 feet long. Nevertheless, uh, a bridge will have to be built over SR43, and you can see that even though SR43 is a two-lane road right now, there has been provisions in place to widen it to four lanes someday. So this high-speed rail bridge will have to bridge the entire four-lane right-of-way. Uh, and because of the design changes with the uh, shortening of the Cross Creek Viaduct, which was going to actually have a, a really cool steel truss bridge over the actual Cross Creek. But uh, because that whole thing has been axed and redesigned, uh, I believe it will just be a short bridge over the SR-43 and earth-filled embankment connecting uh, the, S the bridge over SR-43 to the Cross Creek Bridge, which, like I said, will be about 2,500 feet long. So probably about where these pipes are is the, uh, the start of the Cross Creek Viaduct. And given all of these pipes and rebar cages that are laid out, it appears that construction on this viaduct will probably begin sooner rather than later because again, uh, all of construction, pa all of all three construction packages are uh, intended to be completed by uh, December the end of 2023 uh, that won't be a problem for CP4 as we will see in the next video in this series CP4 is by far the furthest along of the three construction packages but uh, it's going to be quite a challenge for uh, Dragados to complete CP23 by the end of 2023 especially considering the number of projects that they have yet to begin like uh, we saw back there with the uh, Tule River Viaduct. They are working on it, but it is a very slow process. Here we see a canal crossing, and uh, you can see that uh, there was a, a precast box culvert in parallel with the uh, cast-in-place culvert that is completed. So it's it's pretty interesting to see how many how many canals there are out here. It's pretty incredible. And also, because of all of these canals, Hanford is, or the area around Corcoran excuse me is the kind of epicenter for the Central Valley sinking because uh, so much groundwater has been pumped out of the Central Valley that the land has sunk in some places like 12 to 15 feet it's, it's pretty incredible actually that there isn't more uh, damage to existing infrastructure obviously there's been some isolated incidents with bridges and whatnot but Obviously, the High-Speed Rail Authority is 
keeping that in mind and designing accordingly. So here we have the Lansing Avenue grade separation, which I believe will be some sort of underpass or something like that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see that going forward. Doesn't appear to be much work in that area. And here I'm just kind of noticing this for the first time. It appears to be some kind of water retention structure that we're passing over. You can see that there's some kind of culvert connecting the two halves of that structure that uh, was bisected by the high-speed rail right away. Anyways, just ahead is the Kansas Avenue grade separation, and uh, this, uh, as well as the Kent Avenue grade separation just to the north of it, are places where the bridges are done, the road bridges are complete, but the bridge has not been opened yet because of ongoing utility relocation, at which we can see off to the right side of this bridge. Um, not exactly sure which type of utility it is, but we can see that new uh, canal culvert there that likely was part of it and as well as the power lines which appear to still be in place there so i'm sure that uh, as soon as those utility relocations are complete we will see that ramp finished and uh, we'll see the road paved and traffic shifted onto the new grade separation So just south of the Kent Avenue grade separation up ahead, we can see what appears to be some relocated power lines. You can see them curving off to the right and to cross the high-speed rail tracks perpendicularly. Uh, but as we can see, there's also ongoing utility relocation on the west side of the high-speed rail tracks that has impeded the progress of the Kent Avenue grade separation. But again, I'm sure that will be taken care of sooner rather than later. We can also see a number of uh, lagoons here off to the left. Uh, I believe those are associated with the, da the dairy just west of it. Uh, those would be uh, feces retention lagoons. Uh, it's not a very pretty sight, but it also appears there's no water there. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see how that uh, is going to work out. Here, I believe uh, a bridge will be built to carry SR43 over the high-speed rail tracks. I don't believe the high-speed rail tracks will cross over SR43. Uh, you can see that land uh, appears to be cleared to begin construction on this bridge. But again, it's, it's one of many projects that uh, really hasn't seen a whole lot of work going on yet. And so it... Uh, it's going to be quite a rush to get this entire project completed by December of 2023. I'm not saying they can't do it. They absolutely can. But I would imagine that they would require uh, hiring a lot more people to uh, get this project done on time. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes going forward. And I'd like to say that I'll be doing one of these updates every year, but as you may have noticed by how long it's taken to get this video out, uh, is quite a quite a big project. This is quite an undertaking, and I'm, I'm glad that I, I did it. I wish I would have gotten it out sooner because this footage was you know filmed in August, and it's now October, late October. And so I apologize for the delay in getting these videos out, but uh, nevertheless, it has been a, a huge undertaking. And... Even though the environmental impact reports are available, like I said, uh, here we are at Jackson Avenue and you can see that the bridge is basically complete, but the barrier walls uh, have not been formed up yet. So who knows? I Hopefully that is, will be completed before too long. But anyway, even though the environmental impact reports are 
available to the public via a freedom of information request. Uh, making sense of them is very difficult. And I, I know that might sound kind of laughable to people involved in the project or whatever, or people that are used to reading EIRs and engineering reports, but it's been a lot of work trying to make heads or tails of everything. And uh, here we have another canal crossing next to these high voltage lines, and it appears that they might have mapped out or graded out the uh, the alignment of the canal to be shifted off to the west there, but it uh, doesn't appear that that has been completed just yet. And again, I'm not sure if it looks like this canal is still in use, even though there's no water in it. Uh, like again, again, it's probably a seasonal canal, but uh, so much work is ongoing. Here uh, you can see that Avenue, Idaho Avenue grade separation was in a similar state to, to Jackson Avenue. And of course, these high voltage lines need to be removed because they're sitting right in the middle of the high speed rail right of way. So, so there's a lot of factors that the high speed rail authority can't control completely and certainly utility relocations is one of them. But uh, I'm glad that I was able to get all this footage recorded so that we can see every, every part of this project because I know that there's a lot of people interested in it and uh, certainly I am as well. I believe Iona will have a grade separation, but it may that may have been cut. So I, I put that card in there saying grade separation because I believe it will still be completed, but uh, Iona Avenue may be one that is actually closed. I'm not 100% sure, but again, we will see as the project continues. One thing that just kind of blows my mind is how much corn is grown in the Central Valley. Uh, because as far as I can tell, this corn is field corn that's being... Uh, grown for the nearby dairies and uh, <laughs> obviously it makes sense to somebody or else they wouldn't be growing it but uh, yeah the Midwest grows a, a ton of corn and I'm, I don't know if field corn is necessarily the most important crop that could be grown with California's very limited water resources but hey I'm, I'm not making the decisions so uh, anyway it's just kind of funny to me because <laughs> from like Nebraska to Pennsylvania. I mean, it's all corn, so <laughs> I don't know how much corn we need. But anyway, here, Houston Avenue will receive a great, receive a grade separation. I believe it will be probably a conventional one. Uh, but uh, again, with that canal in the way, I'm sure that has complicated issues as well as the high voltage lines. I'm sure that has all led to progress being slow on that grade, uh, grade separation, but Nevertheless, in two years, I'm sure it will be done, so. Here at Hanford Armona Road, you can see, I believe that's a newish uh, canal crossing that crosses that road at an angle. It certainly appears that way, but uh, yeah, it doesn't appear to be a ton of work on the high-speed rail right-of-way in this section. As you can see where the Hanford viaduct is in the, in the distance, the tracks will be crossing right through this facility, so I'm sure... Uh, there's probably been ongoing negotiations or disagreements or whatever with whatever this facility is. It looks like it may be some sort of, uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> some sort of factory or disposal area or something like that. But uh.
Anyways, here we are at the biggest project on CB23, which is the 6,000 foot long Hanford Viaduct. Now, like I said, this was, again, it was originally planned to bring the high-speed rail tracks into Hanford more or less at grade, but uh, that was changed, and it the change to make it in a completely aerial viaduct has added $109 million to the project. But uh, you can see that as it uh, transitions from two tracks to four tracks, the station will actually be located on this viaduct. It will be known as the King's Tulare Regional Station or something like that. But uh, nevertheless, it will uh, be, I'm sure, used by people of Hanford and uh, Visalia off to the east. Here we have the uh, where the high-speed rail tracks cross the San Joaquin Valley Railroad, which is a short line uh, that interchanges with both Union Pacific and BNSF. And off to the left, we can see the precast concrete facility where all the precast concrete elements used on CP23 are manufactured. That uh, was kind of an innovative uh, move on the uh, Dragados joint venture project, uh, building their own precast concrete facility instead of utilizing existing ones, because obviously they realized they could save money, but more importantly, I, I'm sure there probably wasn't the capacity to build as many precast concrete girders and everything else, uh, culvert segments that they would need on this project, so... And here at the north end, uh, just south of Grangeville Boulevard, I brought it up in my overview video. Uh, it appears that there might have been some redesign work going on. Uh, some people have mentioned that that large amount of soil was there to compact the soil, as is often done in construction. When a large amount of soil needs to be compacted, uh, dirt is just piled up and left there for, you know, sometimes weeks or months, however long the engineers determine it needs to be left there. But anyway, uh, after the Hanford Viaduct, we transitioned back to an elevated dirt embankment, and uh, we have several more grade separations north of Hanford that will be completed. It would have been really nice if a road like Avenue 7.5 off to the left extended along the entire California High Speed Rail right away. That would make filming this with a drone about a thousand times easier, but uh, I guess that's what adds to the fun of the whole process. <laughs> So anyway, here at Fargo Avenue, uh, we have ongoing construction. You can see that the piers are being uh, formed up, and I'm sure that uh, construction has moved on since this was filmed. Uh, with those, uh, the design of most of these bridges uh, is and uses the uh, precast concrete girders, so I'm sure that this bridge will be no different. Hence the uh, need for that precast facility that we just passed. And uh, a little bit north of here, we'll see another, uh, like a, a precast concrete girder storage facility for the uh, for the Conejo Viaduct. So uh, that's that'll be kind of interesting. Of course, we'll I'll point it out when we get there. But So here is yet another uh, canal, uh, I believe this is the East people, east branch of the People's Ditch uh, that will have to be realigned. Obviously the high speed rail is not going to build a viaduct because that, that or a culvert that long, that was probably be about a thousand feet long. So I'm sure a shorter canal culvert that uh, crosses the tracks perpendicularly will be built. So here, uh, similar to uh, Iona and Jackson, we have a bridge that is largely complete, but the barrier walls have not yet been formed up. So I'm sure that uh, Dragados is probably packaging these projects together to have uh, maybe the same people working on them, so that have the same laborers that get really good to kind of manufacture these elements in kind of an assembly line type thing. I would imagine I may be completely wrong, but it kind of appears to be what's going on there. So I'm sure that scheduling for all of these projects is kind of a nightmare, especially considering 
all of the factors like utility relocations, which are kind of out of both the contractors and the high speed rail authorities' hands. So I'm sure that there is some method to the madness, but uh, I'm just a casual observer, of course. I'm not in any way affiliated with the project, but I'm sure that everybody is probably doing about as best of a job as they can do, even though uh, Dragato says kind of taken some heat for uh, maybe times in the past where they've kind of used change orders to pad maybe their uh, profit margin. But uh, I'm not saying that's necessarily what's going on here. I would just like to see this project uh, be completed. Here at Elder Avenue, I believe there's going to be a grade separation there, but it may actually just be closed. I'm not 100% sure. Either way, these high voltage lines that we've been following will have to be realigned to... Uh, most likely cross the high-speed rail tracks at perpendicular and uh, get out of the middle of the right-of-way. <laughs> Here at Excelsior Avenue, we can see, uh, just like Kent and Kansas Avenues before this, uh, the bridge is completely finished, but ongoing re utility relocation uh, is affecting the completion of the west approach ramp, and uh, therefore the road is not paved and the bridge is not yet open. But like so many other projects on this project, I'm sure that will be finished sooner rather than later. Here we have a massive canal culvert uh, that is appears to be complete. The right of way is built up on top of that, so that's kind of nice, nice to see. Uh, that culvert might have actually had gates on it. It's hard to tell from this angle, but uh, that looked to be kind of a, a uh, unique crossing there. And take a look around, uh, like I said earlier, as we get further north, uh, there's more water because we're getting closer and closer to the Sierras. And so there's more orchards and more fields in general that are actually populated with plants. Here at uh, Dover, 8, Dover Avenue and 8th Avenue, you can see that this rather complicated grid separation is being built. And uh, Dover, or 8th Avenue, excuse me, is being uh, swung east of the high-speed rail tracks to form two T-road intersections. Now, I know these grade separations uh, have drawn a little bit of criticism from uh, outside observers of this project and critics of this project, but uh, nevertheless, keep in mind that this, the whole Central Valley is ha and San Joaquin Valley has been built out on a grid with county roads basically every mile in both directions, and uh, these roads are used by slow-moving agricultural equipment as well as you know people that live out here and work out here and the high-speed rail authority is bisecting the valley and creating a lot of barriers as it is and closing even more roads than the project is already calling to close is would just not not work um the agricultural vehicles and traffic need to get around to access the different fields and they also need uh, road access to carry their uh, products to market and gen in all in all i mean this this whole area has been pretty well developed so it's it might seem like you know maybe a waste of money in some places building these very complicated grade separations but uh keep in mind the authority is is doing what they have to i mean they, they just can't close roads it's this is this is america <laughs> and, and so like it's it's hard to compare building high-speed railways in America with the the rest of the world because most countries are not built up to the level that the United States is with county roads every mile like forever obviously in the non-agricultural parts of the West uh, that's not necessarily the case like in the mountains of course 
but in agricultural areas it that it, it, it's just the way of life i mean they they just can't close roads basically anyways we just passed over the king's river which will of course have a large viaduct oh uh carrying high-speed trains over it and here at Caro avenue we can see that the great separation is being basically completed the wing walls are being framed out so i'm sure that uh if this if Caro avenue isn't yet reopened to traffic it will be before too long you can also see the msc retaining wall is being uh, built there as well so kind of unlike some of the other grade separations we've seen on this project particularly in uh, cp1 uh the 8th 9th avenue has not been realigned a second viaduct is actually being built over 9th avenue and i would hazard a guess that's probably be because 9th avenue is a rather busy road you can see that it's paved which alone makes it <laughs> a busier road but uh yeah we can see that the deck is being uh the rebar is laid there so i'm sure progress on that bridge is even further along now So here we have a succession of several high-speed rail viaducts over various rivers. And up ahead we have yet another uh, precast concrete facility, which will be manufacturing huge precast concrete segments for these various bridges. Uh, I didn't really know what to make of this at the time of filming, but I have since realized that these huge concrete tubs are being manufactured here on site, and you can see three of them off to the right there. This is really kind of interesting. Uh, they, they've changed the design of these bridges to use these uh, precast elements, theoretically, to speed up construction, but also uh, precast concrete elements like these have usually a little bit higher quality. And so it's really just kind of interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing these bridges progress uh, to see what the final design looks like actually in place. Nevertheless, I, I think this whole area is really just kind of interesting. Here's uh, the Coal Slough, uh, which is yet another river through this area. That is definitely not a canal. And up ahead, we have yet another bridge over SR-43. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the abutment walls have been completed, and I'm sure that progress is probably spanning SR-43 at this point, at least with false work. Uh, looks like this bridge is moving right along. Off to both the left and the right, you can see what are massive dirt borrow sites. I kind of uh, showed this a little bit last year, but obviously with having 65 miles of elevated embankments and all of the necessary embankments for the grade separations, a massive amount of dirt has been <laughs> needed. And so you can see that, uh, that wall area that they haven't dug out yet is probably 10 or 15 feet high. I mean, they've taken a massive amount of dirt out of here even though it might be a little bit hard to see on the drone video but uh it's quite a quite a large area and i'm, I'm sure that there's other dirt borrow sites across the right-of-way even if they aren't a, directly adjacent to the tracks So up ahead we have the Davis Avenue grade separation which 
Kind of funny enough, uh, has inadvertently been the stopping point for both of these high-speed rail updates. Uh, Davis Avenue is currently closed to traffic, obviously because they're building this massive bridge, which uh, is also kind of interesting. It's a cast-in-place bridge, not a precast girder bridge like so many others. But I'm sure that has to do with how long the bridge span is because of the uh, very large obtuse angle that the road is crossing the tracks at. But uh, nevertheless, this has been a kind of halfway stopping point on these two video uh, production runs. So here we are. We'll be transitioning to the next day, which was a Sunday, very shortly before we uh, reach the next grade separation, I believe. Also, keep in mind, I've gotten several comments saying that uh, because of all of these curves, which may appear to be too sharp to support high-speed trains, uh, some people are thinking that the trains won't actually be able to achieve their intended uh, top speed of uh, 220 miles an hour or 186 miles an hour from day one. And uh, I, may <laughs> I may be eating crow someday if the trains... I have to slow down on these curves, but I would hazard a guess the High Speed Rail Authority has factored that in uh, based on operating or curve radiuses from other High Speed Rail systems. And I, I don't think that they would make such a foolish maneuver. So, I mean, keep in mind, we are probably at this point like 300 feet in the air. So everything may look kind of distorted and appear to be a sharper curve than it actually is. Um, but here we have, yeah, the two grade separations at Fowler and Elkhorn Avenue, uh, which don't have any bridges being built yet, but a massive amount of dirt has been built up on either side. And I would hazard a guess that sooner rather than later, work on those two bridges will begin. I believe Clovis Avenue will actually be rerouted or closed. Uh, I don't believe, yeah, there's going to be a, a third bridge built there. Here we can see, yes, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, Clovis Avenue is going to be realigned uh, to cross over the high-speed rail tracks kind of at an angle. At least that's the information that I was able to glean from the environmental impact reports. But anyway, here we are on the next day. You can see that the lighting definitely changed as this is morning light. And we are coming up on the that precast staging yard that I was talking about for the uh, Conejo Viaduct. So Mini Wawa Avenue will be rerouted off to the west side of the high-speed rail tracks on the left there. And here are all of the precast girders for, I believe, various grade separation bridges as well as the Conejo Viaduct in the distance. You can see the girders are of varying length, so obviously they're going probably to many different areas. And that, uh, that staging yard is all fenced off, uh, even though the fence is kind of hard to see. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's incredible because I, I believe, yes, Clarkson Avenue will also have to be uh, receive a grade separation. But it's incredible how how big these structures are. Uh, this Conejo Viaduct up ahead is just absolutely massive. And uh, this whole project is massive. <laughs> Everything about it is massive. It's it's kind of unbelievable. And so that's why I'm, I'm glad that I was able to document this construction for the second year in a row in a much more complete fashion. So here we are uh, just south of the Conejo Viaduct on the BNSF. The reason for this viaduct is that the tracks will cross over the BNSF tracks and continue on the west side of the BNSF into Fresno. So here is the Ave uh, Peach Avenue viaduct, which you can see is nearly complete. It appears that the uh, rebar for the barrier walls has been installed, but the walls have not yet been framed up. Uh, here are the BNSF rock cars for the upcoming uh, BNSF trackage realignment, which we will be able to see from the air. 
But you can see that construction is definitely in full swing. We had to get talked through form B in this area and uh, that this is just an absolutely massive structure. <laughs> um, we, in this next video in CP4, we will actually see uh, the view of, from the San Joaquin that I was riding going under the Wasco viaduct. So it will be a similar structure to this Conejo viaduct. So make sure you subscribe and uh, see that video when it comes out. I will get it out as soon as possible, I promise. But either way, you can see that rebar for the deck for the Peach Avenue viaduct has been installed there. And uh, they may have actually poured that deck at this point. I'm not 100% sure. But nevertheless, you can see where those rock cars were located is a new siding that BNSF has built, likely to offset the track relocation that we will see a little bit north of here. Um, but nevertheless, yes, this Conejo viaduct is massive and... Uh, Here's Conejo Avenue, and the town is called Conejo, hence the name of the viaduct. So. Off to the right, we can see a massive industrial area with a freezer facility. You can see all those refrigerated cars. I'm not exactly sure what is coming out of here, but uh, it may be uh, processed uh, fruit or something like that from, from the valley. Obviously, the p days of the Pacific Fruit Express are long in the past, but nevertheless, a massive amount of food is still transported by rail, at least non-perishable food or you know, semi-perishable food that uh, can last more than a few, uh, a couple of weeks on the, on the train. It might not take that long, but it, it likely does to get it across the country and uh, offloaded in, into stores. So not exactly sure what... Uh, what is all being grown here, but you can be rest assured that they are growing everything under the sun, basically. <laughs> and uh, it appears that uh, that road has obviously already been closed and that cul-de-sac that we just passed over will be realigned. I apologize for the way the lighting keeps changing. We're actually on my old drone right now. Uh, which I was able, I was, had to use both of my drones because uh, I only have six batteries for my new drone and each battery lasts like 25 minutes. So, and charging them takes over an hour. So I had to employ my old non-4K drone, which doesn't, uh, it's white balance, auto white balance isn't nearly as good as the new drone. So that's why the lighting keeps changing rather dramatically and I do apologize for that. Either way, here at the Mountain Avenue grade separation, which will be a massive, massive grade separation, similar to what we saw with uh, Dover and 8th Avenue, uh, you can see that this road, uh, this kind of perpendicular T intersection will be raised and, uh, and Chestnut Avenue will be rerouted off to the right. So obviously a lot of uh, land has been cleared for this right of way and I would imagine because this road was actually closed at this time uh, that uh, work has begun on this project or will begin very shortly because it will definitely take a long time to complete all of this. We can see that a massive culvert has been built to carry that canal under the future intersection, but you can see, yeah, the, the footprint of this grade separation is going to be huge. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> and uh, all through this area, the BNSF tracks were actually... The BNSF tracks are located more or less where the high-speed rail tracks will be. Uh, because they will be rerouted off to the right and um, so that the high-speed rail tracks can maintain a very shallow curve to maintain their higher operating speeds. And up ahead is yet another solar installation, a relatively small one that will have to be somewhat removed. Some of the panels will have to be removed to make space for the high-speed rail tracks, which you can see off in the distance just north of Nebraska Avenue. Nebraska Avenue will receive a grade separation, I do believe. Uh, it's a pretty busy road, as you can see from all the traffic. 
uh, but it doesn't appear that much work has been going on yet. So two independent sections of BNSF trackage will have to be realigned. We are past the uh, first section uh, south of Nebraska Avenue there because you can see the high-speed rail alignment has been clearly graded out and built up off to the le on the left side. Uh, but up ahead will be the second section of BNSF track realignment. And uh, obviously uh, the BNSF is cooperating, but they're... they're demands kind of come first and foremost uh, ahead of the high-speed rail construction so I know there have been uh, some delays due to both BNSF and UP but particularly BNSF with the San Joaquin's and all of the traffic coming between North and South Cal Northern and Southern California this line is very busy and uh, BNSF has canceled many form B's to keep uh, access trains access to their right away limited and so that trains can keep moving um but uh nevertheless this will be completed at some point and uh we can see all the track up ahead has been skeletonized that where they that's what they the term they use when they have the ties laid out and the rail installed but the ballast has not been installed that uh little switch off to the right is a temporary switch a hand throw switch and that is how new freight tracks are constructed in this country. Um, those temporary switches will be installed on the on the main and to allow the rock cars that we just saw from the San Joaquin ride to access the new track and begin dumping rock so that the new tracks can be surfaced. But uh, up ahead, uh, there's still a grade crossing where the tracks have not been installed in the roadway yet. And so the uh, tracks are not yet connected. But nevertheless, I'm sure that this project will be moving along uh, shortly. You can see with that large signal tower off to the right, uh, controlling access to the siding and a uh, few yard tracks, that this is quite a, a large project, um, relocating all of these BNSF tracks. Uh, this is the small town of Bowles, California, and here at Manning Avenue, which will eventually receive a grade separation we can see that uh, the tracks have not been installed across the roadway yet. I'm sure that uh, needs to keep various county roads open while the other one, other grade separations are being built has also kind of delayed installation of this. I know, uh, I believe Fresno County uh, fined the High Speed Rail Authority or the contractor for keeping two uh, adjacent grade separations closed simultaneously. Because, like I said, uh, this is America, and cars are king, and uh, the roadway traffic has to keep moving even throughout construction. So that is sequencing all of these projects so that road traffic isn't impacted has also been a big hurdle and a big uh, probably time delay issue. But uh, nevertheless, you can see uh, some of these yard tracks off to the right next to the two main line tracks and up ahead is the south avenue grade separation which appears to be largely complete i don't believe it was actually open to traffic when this video was shot but i would imagine if it's not open just yet it will be open very shortly because the bridge and roadway are done but uh, south avenue represents the northern end of the uh, bnsf track realignment and here we have this uh yeah, here we you can as we pan off to the left, you can see the road was still closed, even though it was striped. So, like I said, I'm sure that is open or will be very shortly. But just south of South Avenue, we can also see yet another cal uh, canal crossing and what appears to be temporary culverts underneath the uh, BNSF tracks. Here we are back on the San Joaquin and passing under South Avenue. So we can see that, yeah, not much has changed since the drone footage. But uh, 
You can also see that red flag off to the right indicating that we are entering a form B because I believe that uh, this uh, crossover that we're about to traverse is also being relocated north. We, uh, there's a southbound San Joaquin uh, with a similar configuration of the train that we're running even though it had a different locomotive. And uh, here you can see the new crossover with the signals that have not yet been cut in. So this will make a lot more sense once we return to the air. But uh, we can also see that more work was ongoing at the next grade separation, which is known as Adams Avenue. So like I said, I'm sure that uh, the tracks not being laid across Manning Avenue for the BNSF track relocation has been impacted by South Avenue being closed and potentially by Adams Avenue being worked on as well. But, uh, but yes, you can see that these crossovers are high-speed turnouts, so likely... Uh, good for at least 50 miles an hour and uh, that's going to be replaced with a new crossover a new high-speed crossover just north of there so I I'm sure that this is in some way re uh, associated with the track relocation it might have been something that BNSF kind of demanded as far as uh, allowing access or allowing their tracks to be relocated they probably stipulated that they had to replace this crossover for some reason, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, here we are at Adams Avenue, and I believe we'll be returning to the San Joaquin once again to see that work is actually ongoing on this project. You can see here when this drone footage was shot that pilings had been installed, but uh, now the columns are actually being formed up, so that is nice to see work ongoing. And here we can see those columns from the train, and uh, now that I think about it, yes, uh, South and Adams Avenue being closed simultaneously is what incurred that fine from Fresno County. I believe it was actually like a million dollar fine. So that kind of shows you how serious <laughs> the uh, local governments are about keeping roads open. Uh, so, But for whatever reason, uh, Drugados decided to incur that fine and uh, work on those roads simultaneously. Clayton Avenue, I believe, is clo will be closed. It is obviously open to traffic currently because of those two grade separations that were being built just south of here. But um, I don't believe that we'll receive a grade separation in the future. Lincoln Avenue, I believe, will be replaced with uh, a grade separation as well. But like uh, like I said earlier, it's hard to glean exactly which roads are going to be open and which more roads are going to be closed because the plans have definitely changed. So uh, I believe Lincoln Avenue will uh, not be closed and receive a grade separation, but uh, we'll just have to see. So off to the left appear to be more offices associated with uh, CP23 because, like I said, CP23 ends uh, 1,000 feet south of East American Avenue, which is the road off in the distance. So I believe these offices are associated with Dragados and the CP23, uh, but I, I may be wrong. This may be uh, CP1 already. Either way, uh, we are nearing the end of CP23. And because we are approaching the East American Avenue grade separation. So thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Sorry if you didn't like my rambling. But uh, if, you, if you made it this far, it's probably too late to tell you. But I will be uploading all three construction packages, the drone footage, into one long video. Which will probably be about two hours long. But I've always thought it would be cool to be able to watch one video with all the drone footage nonstop. So... As soon as I get the CP4, CP4 video out, uh, make sure you watch out for that. But uh, I'm going to just let this video play out with a little bit more of the San Joaquin cab ride uh, through this area and up towards the Cedar Viaduct just north of here in CP1. Um, let me know if you want to see more of this San Joaquin uh, kind of quote unquote cab ride video. I didn't record the whole thing but you can see that uh, there is some of the intrusion protection barrier wall being built 17 miles of uh, barrier wall will have to be built as part of CP23 to protect uh, 
the high-speed rail tracks from freight train derailment incursions and vice versa, even though it's obviously much more likely on the high, uh, freight railroad tracks. But uh, yeah, let me know if you want to see more of this video. I'd be happy to upload it. And uh, it's, yeah, it's nice to see the the, uh, the right of way from a different perspective. I'm glad that I was able to make it down to Bakersfield and uh, ride the San Joaquin back. But anyway, I've talked enough. Thank you so much for watching. I will let this video play out. Uh, if you want to see more, subscribe, like, blah, 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 share. Yeah, <laughs> you know the drill. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I will see you all soon.